Okay, we're, we are recording. So welcome, Anastasi. Thank you, Rob. Um, so this is uh, my friend and colleague, Anastasi Ciotis, who's a uh, Feldenkrais teacher, trainer, uh, practitioner, uh, I think one of the best. Uh, and I've been working with Anastasi, what, we're, I think we're approaching 20 years, something like that. Uh, it's, it's been, been a, a while, time. yeah. It's been a long time, yeah. I, yeah, I think it is 20 years, actually. Yeah, yeah. so um, Anastasi has given me many, many one-on-one uh, -on -one sessions, and also he has ongoing group classes called Awareness Through Movement classes for people who aren't familiar with the Feldenkrais method. And uh, so usually I'm in one of his classes once a week whenever I'm in town and available. Um, Anastasi, since we, we were just before the call, we were, um, we were talking a little bit about who might be watching this. And we sort of came to the conclusion that some of the folks that may be watching may not be familiar with the Feldenkrais method at all. So I, I know it's the nightmare question that every Feldenkrais person dreads. Uh, do you want to say a couple, <laughs> a couple words about what this method is? Yeah, firstly, um, it's not Christ. It doesn't have a T on the end. Feld, it's uh, Feldenkrais, it's a, yeah. Feldenkrais rhymes with rice rather than with a T. Um, Even though it's, it's Easter. Just, yeah. It happens to be yeah, Easter. It happens to be Easter Sunday as we're recording this. Um, yeah, the, the word's odd. It's the name of a fellow, Moshe Feldenkrais. He was um, an interesting guy. He, um, let's see, his life, he was born in, uh, I think it was 1904. He passed in 1984. He was... Um, somebody who lived through difficult times uh, at an early age. He was raised in the Ukraine at an early age um, because of the impending wars. He was one of the first folks that went to then Palestine to form the State of Israel, uh, one of the um, early settlers. I think he, he left at around the age of 14 from his home and trekked across Europe um, and there's a famous story of him gathering a band of individuals who uh, joined him along this uh, path to, to the journey to Israel. Um, while in Israel, he was involved in, as a young man, building new homes. He had a lot of um, aspirations in the athletic uh, field. He, he played a lot of soccer. He injured himself playing soccer. And... Mm. Um, I'll, I'll jump forward uh, to his um, academic life. He, he actually uh, went to France, studied um, mechanical engineering, and then later uh, read for a PhD in physics at the Sorbonne. And um, let's see, he, he got exposed to uh, Eastern traditions uh, of jiu-jitsu and judo. He was one of the first people to be trained um, in judo in the West, mm. and he was not one of the first to be trained, but one of the first to open an official judo school in Paris. Um, and his uh, situation with wars at that time, it was the Second World War, and when the um, Nazis were entering uh, France, he was working for the Curie's lab, Joliot Curie, and he, um, they sent him out of the country uh, very quickly, and actually he had apparently in his suitcase the uh, recipe for heavy water, uh, which was the basis of the atom bomb. Anyway, he got to England. Uh, that is an interesting story there, but he ended up working for the British Admiralty in um, anti-submarine uh, work, developing sonar, and he had incredible skills hmm. um, in that field, academic and physics. But at the same time, he also suffered a lot from his um, uh, knee injury that he had developed playing soccer as a young man, and then on submarines, etc. he continued to injure it. 
long story short, he uh, went to find out about having a surgery to repair his knee injury. And they told him that, yeah, he, he would have a surgery. It would take about six months to recover. And he didn't like the idea of being pinned down at that point in his life. And he said, well, how will that, what's the um, outcome to, of this kind of surgery? And the folks said, well, you they have a 50-50 chance of walking normally again. Mm. So he didn't think that was very good odds. And he started to apply his brilliant scientific mind to the idea of how we um, come to understand ourselves in movement. Since mm. he had done a lot of physical activity in the martial arts and some of his trainers really helped him understand the philosophy of martial arts not being something about going out there and killing people, more that it was about um, maturation and, and the, the higher level people in the martial arts are, are often talking about the philosophy rather than the, you know, survival side of it. Mm. In any case, um, Feldenkrais studied himself, studied his knee, spent many hours in bed imagining, understanding, reading anatomy, looking at action, understanding that, um, there was a, an emotional component to the physical injury. He understood the physics of the physical injury and he started to heal himself in this process. And to cut a long story short, he started to apply this to himself. He started to improve. And then he started to, to do this with other people. And uh, these were his fellow scientists in Scotland, actually, where he was doing this work. And he read, of course, a lot of. Um, uh, people that were also in this emerging field of somatic study uh, mm. wasn't called that in those days, but certainly Alexander technique that some people might know about was already mm. about. And um, there were many others who were seminal in this field in Europe, uh, Goethe, Alexander, um, anyway, many other people that informed uh, the way Feldenkrais thought about this stuff. And of course, in that time since Alexander uh, Freud and his work had become popular and well understood. And so the idea of the, the individual, the unconscious, the, the personality in the formation of our image of ourselves also got folded into Feldenkrais's work. So, um, and then Feldenkrais started to think after he left England and went back to Israel, uh, still engaged in the scientific field, um, he started to think about how he might do this work with groups of people. So from the individual one-on-one -on -one work, he developed the work called Awareness Through Movement, as you mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. And um, this is unusual in the field of um, physical activity in that the teacher, as you know, does not demonstrate what you're to do in the class. It's rather a verbal instruction and people are left to discover and what they discover in the process of the lesson, because each class is considered a lesson, um, is to be applied to their everyday living. And um, in some ways, one famous teacher in our work uh, calls Feldenkrais' work the martial arts of daily life, like how you might reach, sit, turn, or perform the everyday functions that you have uh, to do with yourself, how you might explore them like a child explores movement to discover how to do something, how to achieve um, the intended goal. Like if the goal for a child is to roll over and sit up, mm -hmm. how do they do that? There's no blueprint. There's no book they read to work that out. Right. The steps. So, yeah. yeah. So it's a bit like that. That's a very long answer, but um, I hope that so I'm going to, I'm going to give the answer to the same question uh, from myself. Having thought about this for many, many years, um, and and actually, you know, since I've been such a big proponent of this work, my friends are always asking me, well, so what is this? And as you know, many people will kind of jump into, oh, it, so it's just like yoga, or it's just like, you know, martial arts, or it's just like this, which uh, of course it isn't just like those things. Um, I, I say uh, very often that it's the study of coordination. 
is one way that I think about it. And, and the study of awareness and attention and how to pay attention to your body and to sensation and to movement. Um, and really how to become a connoisseur of movement and making finer and finer distinctions. Um, and I'm going to come right back to that. I, I, I did want to say uh, that to frame this, this conversation a bit, that this, this is a conversation. We didn't rehearse anything. Um, we, we have a couple touch points that we may get to. Uh, but we're really here to to have a conversation and see what comes up, and uh, hopefully something good will come up. Um, but uh, yeah, so one of the points that we we thought we would touch on is the idea of learning, and I I guess in this case it's it's somatic learning, and. Uh, so that's your realm is somatic learning. And I would say in my work as a coach, very often uh, it's behavioral learning. It, it may be physical behavior, but it may be communication patterns, uh, relational patterns between people uh, or our relation to the things that we're trying to achieve in our life. So we, we thought we might talk about what what has to be there to sort of set up conditions for learning to occur. Uh, so maybe we can start with that. And coming back to that last piece that I mentioned about a, a connoisseur, um, one of my new teachers, a guy named Peter Furco, who teaches yoga, was talking about uh, the idea of a connoisseur and somebody learning how to drink wine or, or learning how to be a chef and that you learn to make finer and finer distinctions. And, you know, one of my teachers over the years said the difference between a place where you're an expert or a master, not a master, uh, and when you're a beginner is just that you have many, 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 many more distinctions in the realm where, where you're exhibiting mastery. Uh, so, I don't know, maybe we can jump off there in terms of learning. Sure, I think um, so many things to say here, but <laughs> I think you hit a very important topic when you talked about being able to make distinctions. Um, mm -hmm. you know, distinctions is what is the, I think at the root of all learning. You put your hand in the flame, you discover it's hot. You go, oh, I don't wanna do that. You made the distinction that that object and my self don't really go together. So you go, okay. Um, so that's, you know, that's about heat and this, you know, the ability that your hand has, has sensors in it that help you make that distinction about temperature. But for everything, we have um, sensibility in ourselves built in. Like if there wasn't light, we wouldn't have eyes. We wouldn't need them to see. There are creatures that live in non-light environments that have other ways to sense their environment. So um, for every sense, there is a threshold uh, around which we make distinctions. And if you want to look it up, there are, there are all sorts of ratios you can look at online about um, smell, light, touch, taste, all our senses. Are you um, talking about the particular band within which we can sense yeah like if you had sensory a, organs yeah yeah if we're talking about touch for example or the ability to sense weight you know if you're lifting a refrigerator you're not going to feel the fly that lands on it but if you're holding a feather and the fly lands on it you know if you're balancing it in your finger you might go oh there's something happened there so the threshold uh the ratio is such that you can make the distinction so in because how this relates to Feldenkrais and learning and um, creating the conditions for learning is that um, every Feldenkrais lesson is about, let's say, a, a human functional pattern. The reason we don't repeat lessons ad nauseum is because once you've worked out 
the sensory distinctions that you can detect in that pattern, it just falls into habit. And habits are great. You don't want to not have the ability to retain information. That's actually learning. Um, but the problem is when the habit or the thing that we've learned doesn't really serve us because we've changed. For example, let's say a we'll take the example of a chef cooking. You know, the chef, um, you know, at the beginning, you just have to learn the, the, the gamut of what do all these uh, ingredients taste like so that you mm. have a template upon which you can begin to assemble different uh, flavors or intended sensations on your tongue. Uh, let's talk about a musician. Anyone who's first learning to play the, any instrument is going to have very rudimentary motor skills around playing that instrument, and they will need to discover in themselves how does this um, movement of my finger or my breath how does it change uh, the quality of the sound that I'm producing? So you, you, you have to have an interest and then you have to have the ability to explore, to create a new, um, ever new, ever greater uh, level of sensitivity around how you're performing the act. Um, yeah. That, and go ahead. So, yeah, I, I, what I was going to say is it's interesting to think about the, kind of the size of the distinction that a person can make at different points on their journey. Uh, you know, you mentioned music and I, what I find um, in teaching music is that very often in the beginning, somebody can only make really gross distinctions, like very, very vast distinctions. And over time, they can make more and more subtle distinctions. However, I do think there's a sweet spot. And if, if the distinction's too gross, like you were saying with the refrigerator and the fly, they can't notice something. So it's, you almost have to strip away a lot of noise and so that a, a distinction can be perceived. Uh, and I, I think a lot of what, what, I, what I really appreciated about many of the Feldenkrais lessons is they're set up in such a way that it's, it's very hard to miss the distinctions sometimes, sometimes, yeah. you know, it's like, Oh, wow, this, wow. Things feel very different doing something one way versus another. Well, let, the, the important point here is that in a Feldenkrais lesson, in order to make the distinction or in life to make the distinction, you need to slow down. Number one, that's mm. super important in order for your brain to perceive what's happening. Two, in Feldenkrais, often one of the necessary conditions is to reduce the degree of effort, the amount of effort, how much you're engaging with your whole self in order to perform the action. Because, you know, you, you won't make that distinction if there's that much force and effort being engaged in the action. So you, you want to find like, I don't know, to give you a practical example, if I'm sitting here lifting my shoulders, I can lift both my shoulders, you know. Mm. But if I slow that down and I lift just a little bit, say half the speed and half the effort, I can begin to notice that, oh, you know what? One shoulder seems to move more easily. Mm. And interestingly, the shoulder to which I use to write and do all sorts of things with, that one is a little bit more stuck. It's a little bit more sluggish. So I know that you're a lefty, you know, if you lift your shoulders together, do you notice that there's a difference in the ability to lift the shoulder? Mm. To engage in that. So, you know, in, um, it's I a think, condition. It's an important condition to be able to reduce the effort, to be able to hear more clearly what the sensory distinction might be. And I think the, uh, the parallel in the coaching work uh, that I do is that very often when we're in our life, when we're in behavior, uh, two things are happening. One, we're, we're just so in it that we're not aware of our behavior, right? We're, we're not aware of patterns of how we communicate or patterns of how we go for things in our life. Uh, so there's a process of, of slowing down and relaxing the nervous system so that it can notice. Uh, like you were saying, if there's a lot of effort, 
uh, you can't notice, you can't feel something because the and um, very often when people are stuck or experiencing a sense of being stuck in some place in their life, uh, their physiology and their psych psychology will have a rigid structure and a consistent structure that they tend to come back to. So there may be a holding physiologically and there's a holding ideologically also. And it's, I think it, it's not possible to change unless that begins to relax and begins yeah, to slow like down. Yeah, it's like you're enacting the habit pattern. You've already begun to, to do the thing that you do. Like, you know, when you were doing, I mean, a great question from NLP and in Feldman Kreis is, you know, so what do you do when you encounter some difficulty? What's your go-to strategy? And some right. people, because of what culture tells us, you've got to work harder, you know, mm. if it's not happening, then you're just not working hard enough. And this is almost counterintuitive. It's like, okay, it's not working. What can I back off from here? Mm. How could I see a bigger picture? How can I not enact my habit and think of another way or consider another way to consider it? You, you, you can't enact it. You have to step back away from it. You have to reduce mm -hmm. the effort ways as opposed to increase the effort i mean that was my my habit was to to push i was a at one point in my life a professional dancer and if you you couldn't get that thing just work harder mm. uh, this is quite the opposite it's not it's not to say you should only work less it's just in order to know what you're doing if you do a little less maybe you can see the vista of other possibilities that you couldn't be seeing because you've already committed yourself to working in that particular way and and it's tricky to not use effort it's not as easy as it sounds you would think it's like oh let me just stop efforting and everything will work out however to engage in the atten the intention whatever we're going after it kicks off effort in other words, it kicks off a pattern that we're used to. Uh, and so one of the one of the challenges sometimes in Feldenkrais work is to perform an action without engaging effort. And it reminds me of those those things that you stick your finger in and you can't get your you can't the, the harder you try, the more it binds your finger. Mm -hmm. And uh, it kind of feels like that. Like I'm I'm trying not to effort but it's there, the effort is there. So I think another aspect of Feldenkrais work that I like, um, and I think it's a, a, an aspect of good coaching as well, is kind of tricking the nervous system through taking multiple approaches at something. Yeah. Uh, in, inviting the person to, to have to support that activity from a different perspective, perhaps. Yeah, if you can't go from A to B in a linear way, mm. direct, what is the indirect way? I mean, that's an, an example in two points in space, for example, but you can approach that, you can use that thinking. Okay, so if I only have one way of doing something, um, it's kind of digital, it's on or off, it's, uh, mm. it's, uh, what we often call compulsive. I can only, I don't know, fry my egg this way. I don't know. Just, just yeah. the, the idea that uh, variety gives you choices and choices opens up um, the possibility of approaching something in a different way. Yeah, and I, I think that's, if, if I were to say one of, uh, one of the fundamental ideas in Feldenkrais work, it, it is the introduction of variety into any behavioral context. Yeah, you know. yeah because the, the, the idea of being human and having choices about how I act, how I choose to be in the world, um, it gives you resources. It, it allows you to have different responses for different situations. And mm. in the end, it really is about survival because, I mean, in, in our 
limited ways of responding to things, there we actually make ourselves more vulnerable. And if the world isn't the way we want it to be, you know, how do we survive in that? So, yeah. Yeah. It's interesting when, when you think about how uh, Feldenkrais developed this, I think, I don't think the method would have happened had he not had such a significant injury with no way of fixing it. I think and the injury, I think his, um, his life experience, uh, why did he gravitate to, to the martial arts? The fact is he actually wrote a book on how to defend yourself with your bare hands um very early on before he was trained in martial arts because in, at that time when he was a young man in israel uh the british mandate did not allow israelis to carry weapons uh, only the mm -hmm. palestinians had weapons and uh, a lot of people were being killed but he had this oh. sorry about that that's our typical city oh <laughs> I'm, I'm amazed i'm amazed that we haven't had a siren yet but so far yeah. so good that is yeah. Anyway, the yeah, I think his injury, his uh, nothing is by chance in a way. Uh, his his life experience, everything that he had done in his life, gave him this um, incredible uh, resource to come up with something that actually improves one's ability to survive in the world. Mm. Uh, mm. It, it wasn't like alexander work was very much about performing in the world his work mm -hmm. was about how i engage myself posturally to speak to enunciate to play an instrument alexander work is is taught a lot to anyone in uh conservatories in in theater schools um for performance i'd say feldenkrais is also a little about that you can use it to to perform very well as an actor in the world but also it's about how you go about your everyday life and the ability to to be um, self-sustaining to have an image of yourself which is complete enough and mature enough to be able to make good choices about your everyday you know be it what you eat how you uh, utilize your body in the world i guess one thing that's really important at the basis of alexander feldenkrais and many of the somatic practices is that through the vehicle of movement we address our thinking our sensing the world our emotional landscape and um, i found that for me it was a great parallel when i was studying an lp um, mm. how similar the unpacking of our thought process in decision making how similar it was for me in terms of how i would use myself in 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 the action aspect of my life like how i would go about running walking sitting standing working out doing whatever i did i mean if i only did it in one way then i would get the same injuries <laughs> as mm. opposed to um change things up in such a way that i was still maintaining my wellness but actually feeling better and not injuring myself as much for example mm. so yeah it's one of the things that i love with Feldenkrais, I mean, I, I am a big fan of movement. Um, but almost from the very first time that, that you did a session with me, what I was finding was that as you worked on a particular movement with me, all of a sudden I would have an aha that was very much in the realm of my everyday life. And that I wouldn't normally relate to physical behavior. So you might be working on my shoulder and all of a sudden I'd go, oh my God, that's how I need to write this paper that I need to write. <laughs> and it would just be, uh, and very often I wanna stop almost and take notes so that I, that I remember when I, when I get home to approach that thing. I mean, I had one of these sort of physical ahas the other day where uh, we were doing one of the ATM classes, the awareness through movement classes. And it hit me how much 
over effort I put in when I'm just cleaning around the apartment and how much tension I'm holding, which makes it much less pleasant, by the way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I it's interesting, it's really like the, this this dance between the the cognitive mind the, or perceiving mind and the physical somatic. So. I think what we're, what you're alluding to here is this piece that we talk about, and maybe why Feldenkrais was such such a fan of cybernetics, the idea of systems theory that we are mm -hmm. a living system, and that if you change one component, the rest of the system has to adjust. And in some way, if I'm working with your shoulder and the movements that are stuck or, or um, that I'm trying to support so that they can become unstuck, you know, you, you, your mind could go to the, when you last felt that sense of stuckness or, and that might've been while, I don't know, doing something in your apartment. I mean, there is no um, limitation to, in fact, we encourage people to look for the connections in their own experience the lesson doesn't end when we finish the class it's actually just beginning there it's like how do you take this new organization of yourself and the new way you attend to the qualities of movement into mm -hmm. the rest of your daily life so that you can begin to make those associations and make those cognitive changes which are ultimately about learning about saying mm -hmm. oh wow this refined the way i clean my apartment i refined the way i hold my vacuum cleaner and press it into the ground or glide it over the ground lightly. I don't know. So I'm just mm. riffing off what you were saying there. Uh, these are, that's what learning is. That, that's in a way what um, we were talking about at the beginning, that, that we all learn enough to get by. And only if you're very interested in a particular thing, will you go on to make even deeper and deeper sensory distinctions that will help you be, move toward mastery of that particular thing. Mm -hmm. Like a person who knows how to walk, maybe can run, maybe they, they but if they're going to become a hundred meter dash person, they're going to have to refine that and work on it in such a way that they can shave seconds and seconds off their activities so that they can be the best at what they're doing. So, we do enough to learn what's good enough to get by, but if we want to improve and we want to keep improving, um, we need to be attentive to how we do things so that we can constantly upgrade what we've learned to a, a better standard. And in that way, we know now because of the fabulous word that's around neuroplasticity, our brain can keep making new connections and um, we can keep refining ourselves until the day we we don't because we're dead uh so right. <laughs> yeah. yeah learning Evolve. should be a, uh, another famous line that's come up lately is you know lifelong learners yeah we should be thinking that way think of all the wonderful things you haven't done yet that are going to be on your horizon that are going to give you uh greater connections in your brain and who knows the repercussions of those new learnings on the rest of your daily life mm. Uh, oh, I realize I didn't turn off my notification. I hope you didn't hear that beep. Um, well, we we dug in pretty deeply in that in this idea uh, of how to begin to create conditions for learning, uh, and then we meandered about, <laughs> which is fantastic. Um, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna open just another thread, and then uh, and then I think we'll we'll wrap it up for today. Um, you know, we were talking about sort of having an aha moment, uh, which really is learning. I mean, I think learning takes place in making distinctions, and making a new distinction very often is an aha, or is the the beginning, or the seed of an aha. Uh, and then there's the issue of how, how does that come into our life or how do we get it out of the room? Um, and there's this uh, idea, which I know you're familiar with, which is state-dependent learning. Uh, 
and basically what that means for folks who aren't familiar with it is that very often we we learn in a context and very often our brain may isolate that learning to that context so uh i may have an amazing aha about how i can write my paper while i'm on the floor in your class and then when i get home it's it's almost as if there's amnesia to it uh and sometimes i think there is almost a form of amnesia but i think another thing that that can prevent the the transfer um well instead of amnesia i would say forgetfulness is one thing that occurs but another thing that happens uh is when you go into the the original context very often that may reenact the original pattern or the original habit uh, and this this is a huge issue in coaching as well whether whether it's on the phone or over zoom or or in an office or in a in a therapy office that somebody will sort of get uh connected to some new resources and ways of being and then they they go back home and it's they go back to whatever original pattern was there so uh well I, i'd like to hear your thoughts on how to connect things and then i'll i'll talk about it from the coaching side. Yeah, I think the um, topic is very, um, it's very relevant in the Feldenkrais work in that people come for a one-on-one -on -one session, which is called functional integration, because mm -hmm. when we're working with, with the person, it's not so much a verbal exchange, it's more I'm moving the person and sensing how they their underlying organization is around a particular functional action uh, so whatever happens in the session helps the person make that next level distinction the refinement a uh, clarity around something and then what happens is they say how do i get to keep this sensation how do i um, make this part of my innate action in the world as opposed to it disappearing within hours sometimes and this is a very um important piece how does the lesson become sticky and stay with you even that happens also in a maybe even better in an awareness or movement lesson because the teacher isn't actually touching you you're doing the movement yourself and you're discovering what you discover in executing the action the way it's described so I, I feel like, yes, how do we take our learning and take it into different states of being? And I think that from NLP, there is the wonderful uh, tool of the idea of anchoring, you know, creating some kind of moment where I can check in with myself and say, oh, you know, how do my feet connect to the ground? How am I sitting? Where is my head in relation to my pelvis? Or what am i doing with my shoulders when i raise my hands am i doing this or am i able to let my shoulder drop down as i raise my arm i think you have to so an anchor, an anchor just to clarify it's it's hmm. a trigger that we can notice or set up and it's like tying a ribbon around our finger to remind ourselves ah this is the new pattern that i'm that i'm practicing and, right yeah yeah and the basis of these anchors that I'm employing in Feldenkrais work is rather than me tell you what thing you need to be noticing, I mm. want you to tell me what are you noticing now about how you're different in the world, how you're doing whatever it is that you came in that was the problem, the question, whatever. Um, and then you've just got to rely on the fact that it happened. You are doing it now. You need to take a moment. You need to slow down pay attention and see how it is you're enacting that behavior in a new setting and the fact that you're doing it yourself now mediated by me or mediated by yourself means it exists it, it, it's alive in your sensorium in the way you mm. sense the world around you be it what you see hear, feel taste smell it's all there in the moment of the new behavior can you re-evoke those sensations in another setting it's really there is no blueprint for how to do that 
but the fact that you feel it, it's alive in your sensorium now, means that it's happening. That you can no, get access to it. You can get access to it. it. It sounds an awful thing to say to someone. No, you've got it. You will find it again. You have to trust mm. that. The, tra the truth is, one way you can practice ensuring that you've got it is to go back to the old state. Do the, do the thing that doesn't feel so great. And now go ahead them. and do the new thing. Yeah, mm. like bridge between the old and the new behavior right now in this very moment. And mm. ask yourself, what am I doing when I shift to the better state? Yeah, that that's a way to start to consolidate. And and believe me, everything has to be repeated. It doesn't just come. The new synaptic connection in your brain isn't isn't going to stay Instinct. there unless you repeat yes. it. It needs repetition. Um, you ask any musician. You're playing the, the that Bach passage. You have to repeat that passage many many times at a very high level to be able to enact it without thinking about it. It's yeah. really uh you know you, you brought up a <laughs> sorry you, you you're you're bringing up such an interesting uh idea for me which is so in nlp we talk about anchoring and how to anchor and one concept that i find very useful that one of the founders john grinder talked about and i don't hear a lot of people talking about it these days is john grinder said that when you're when you're in a particular state and maybe it's a state or you know some breakthrough that you've just had. And he said, whenever you take an inventory of that state, taking that inventory is anchoring. It is a form of anchoring. Uh, you're giving yourself a, a roadmap for getting access to that state again. You know, you're seeing the breadcrumbs, basically. Yeah. Uh, and I love what you were saying also about connecting the old pattern to the new. That's another way of kind of creating a reminder and beginning to widen the sense of possibilities or variety in that context. Another, another way of, of bridging to a new context, which we, we speak about very explicitly in NLP, and I'm not sure how explicitly in Feldenkrais is this idea of uh, future pacing is the term we use in NLP, which is simply inviting the person to imagine being in the context where they want this to occur, imagining that now. So in the case of me, I'm on the table, I have this, this revelation of, oh, I can write this paper in this new way. Uh, an NLP coach would invite me to, okay, imagine that you're sitting down now to write that and begin to go through the motion and then imagine a week from now and a month from now and six months from now so that you're, you're sort of time traveling and going through that repetition that you were just talking about in the present moment, but you're cognitively uh, rehearsing it so that when you get into the context, you've already rehearsed the pattern and your brain goes, oh, okay, I know how to do this. I've already walked down this, this path several times. Um, yeah, I think, I think that's a very, um, to be honest, we don't have that within the, um, basic repertoire of the work that Dr. Feldenkrais, um, taught us. However, mm. um, there are many micro examples of the same thing in a way when in a lesson we will invite a person who's done something on one side to imagine doing it on the other side mm. and in oh, a that's way, a great example yeah yeah you, because the fact that you can see yourself doing something you haven't yet done mm. in the in the minute by minute moment in a lesson in a 45 minute lesson is really building in a way on the same subconscious operations that would be involved subconscious to conscious operations that would be involved in future pacing so mm. i think that it's definitely there in the work but not in the same quite the same way i think there are many practitioners who have studied nlp that would use it yeah. more obviously like that mm. uh but i do think that you know that the the this so i mean felder i said this uh many times in his teachings you know we're so not aware 
we're only aware of what we can perceive and our perception is distorted. I won't go down that path right now, but we've all got mm. a distorted perception of ourselves. You know, the, mm. the image we have in our head and then we look in the mirror and we're like, oh, you know, that's, a, that's an extreme example of how, mm. how we create an image. Um, and really, Feldenkrais works a lot about the image in that sense. So the idea of having an image of yourself doing the thing in the future with the better organization is very much like a future pacing idea. And I think we have the brilliance in the structure of our brain to be able to conjure that up and utilize it to the best of our ability. I think that's a huge part of what you would call today you know, sports psychology, you know, they're mm. working with the athlete to be in a calm state of mind as they're playing that tennis game, football match, basketball match, running the marathon. I don't know, whatever they're doing, the, the psychological coaches are, are harnessing the person's ability to calm their nervous system, to do what they can do at their peak performance to do that mm. thing. So I don't think you need to be an athlete. I think we're all athletes in that sense, and we can utilize this capacity of our brain. And Feldenkrais lessons are very powerful in that way. Some lessons are done completely just on one side so that you can walk right. around lopsided for the day and go, wow, I had no <laughs> idea I was doing that. And, and the fact that I can transfer that knowledge to the other side is within your capability. Mm. Uh, so in some ways, it's not a parallel I'd ever thought about before until you asked the question, but I think um, that it is very present in the work. And that's why we're always teaching different lessons because we want to keep waking you up to the possibilities of yourself. And I, th and I think that's, I think that's the other way that it happens or that I guess what we're really talking about is how do you integrate a new way of being or a new aha? Uh, yeah. The term integration. And I think one way that that happens is by basically forgetting it, going into your old pattern, and then being reminded again and again and again until something in you goes, oh, wait a minute, I've done this before. Um, and it's, it's funny, in terms of the state-dependent learning, it happens the opposite way, that very often, the minute I get back in the room, and I get down, you know, we do a body scan in the beginning, and I get down on the ground, and I'm like, Oh, the paper. Oh, I could have written the paper. You know, it's like, because everything comes flooding back in that moment. So yeah. um, there's great stories of people walking to their session and feeling better as they're getting to the session because they know they're going to feel better doing the session. So. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, I'll, I'll tell you, uh, when I go and work with uh, some of the various coaches that I work with, very often I set the appointment with an intention of what I want to work on. And I know that I will have it cleaned up by the time I get to the appointment. But I, cause it's happened so many times, but it, so it's at least worth setting the appointment. Yeah. And then I have to think of something <laughs> you save else. save yourself a lot on. of money. Yeah. <laughs> Just set a lot yeah. of appointments with the best teacher. Well, that's a, that perceptual positions. That's another piece in NLP. Like think about the teacher you want to go to and like you go, you have a virtual session in your own mind's eye. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you're giving oh, me some someone nice said, ideas. Tell me to do about this situation. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, thank you. That was that was good. We we did go in a completely different direction and not than uh, than I thought. So, um, but what a pleasure! And let's uh, let's do this again. Yep. Thank you, Rob. My pleasure. Okay. I look All forward right. to it. All right. Take care. Bye bye. Bye bye.